take your Bibles and turn, if you would, to the book of Acts chapter number 2. The book of Acts chapter number 2. I have enjoyed myself. It's a blessing to be here, and I enjoyed the time I've already had to spend with Brother Starnes. It's good I can call him Brother Starnes. He's a Christian. He's a brother in Christ. And I'm so glad I've enjoyed meeting him. And we are barbecue connoisseurs. And um, I didn't say anything about this, but I'll, I'll tell this now. Uh, when we were eating lunch together, we had some great barbecue ribs. And the one I was eyeing, I was just watching the plate went around. He got the very rib I was eyeing. And in my hurry, I grabbed one and dropped it on the floor. So I didn't know what to do. So during prayer, I swapped them out. But, uh, uh, but it was still good, wasn't it? Amen. I kept, he kept going. I don't know what was wrong, but hey. It's barbecue, it doesn't matter, does it? And by the way, I want you to know, I've got a lady in my church that would be perfect for you. Honestly, when she gets out, I'm gonna have her call you. Uh, it'd just be great. The book of Acts, chapter number two, and uh, I wanna say happy birthday to Brother Chapel. What a wonderful blessing, and uh, I'm so thankful uh, just to be his friend. Now, I wanna thank you, church, for loaning your pastor out all across the country, and uh, he's just a great man of God. And so many of us try to emulate what he does and his leadership ability and all that. Nobody can, can measure that. He's just working, doing something all the time. And uh, I appreciate that. And I, I pray for him every day of my life. And many of you that I know and friends here, I, you're on my prayer list. And I pray for you constantly. I told Brother Rasmussen tonight, I said, I pray for you every day. If you would start acting better, I'd feel better about my prayer life. <laughs> so uh, maybe it'll start working. I don't know. But um, I'm, a, I, I'm just glad to be here. It's a wonderful blessing to... To be in the house of God and how and by the way some of y'all are listening to my southern accent Jesus was born in Bethlehem on the south side of Jerusalem so get used to it that's what we talk <laughs> we get to heaven you'll get an accent right off the bat you know you'll get a good one so uh, just learn to do that brother start, that's one thing we won't have to change will it uh, but anyway um, will they have barbecue pork in heaven I, I don't know I'm not sure how that works but Acts chapter 2 let's stand together and look at the word of God for a moment and uh, um Acts chapter number 2, and look, if you would, at verse number 36. Now, excuse me, let's go to verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto him, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear come upon, came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, to every man as every man had need. They continuing day with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I want to speak to you now of this subject, God still can. There are some people here tonight that need a miracle. I want you to know that God's in the miracle working business. I heard a preacher say the greatest moment in time is when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And the greatest miracle in time is when he was raised from the dead. And the same Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8 that raised Christ from the dead, the Bible says, lives in the Christian's heart. We have the same power. We have the same ability. We have that, and there are people in here, it might be a, a, a financial miracle you're facing. It might be some type of relationship. It might be a physical thing. It might, it might no telling what it could be. But I want you to know, I want to tell you tonight that God still works miracles. He's still God. He still can. God still can. Lord, I pray you'll bless us and help us tonight. Thank you for all you do. Meet our needs. Help me to get out of the way. And I pray that they might see Christ through me. Lord, I know and realize that I have no power, that I have no ability other than just having the, the Lord speak through me in your word. I pray you'll bless me tonight. Thank you for this great church. Thank you for my friend, Brother Paul Chapel. I pray you'll bless him. Lord, I pray the greatest days of this ministry might still be in the future. Lord, and I believe that's very possible. And I pray you to help us all. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for Brother Starnes. I pray you help him, Lord, to be just rock solid in his, uh, his call for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray you help him, Lord. I know the devil hates it, but I pray you do a, mir a miraculous thing in his life. 
Lord, I'll thank you and praise you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In Judges chapter 6, Gideon is threshing wheat. He's hiding doing that. And an angel of God. Now, a lot of people, a lot of scholars think that this was a theophany, a display of deity. They, a lot of people think this is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the issue here, but we know it's an elevated position. And this angel of the Lord showed up and said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, If the Lord be with us, then why has all this befallen us? Where be all the miracles that our father spoke of? Where are the miracles? He said, if God's with us, and as he's hiding and threshing wheat, hiding from the Midianites, the angel says, God's with you. And he said, well, okay, then where are the miracles? Now let's move a thousand years up the calendar to Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, and what's happening. And I look in this scripture, and I see four miracles that are just phenomenal that I want to give you, and they all come, and I'm just going to go in and, and give you the best one to I'm going to work down to the first one, so I'll start at the end. But these miracles are phenomenal. Same God, same Lord, you can do whatever. Whatever you're facing. You know, um, my wife is scared to death of spiders. She got bitten by a brown recluse when she was in high school. Spent three or four days in the hospital, almost died. She doesn't like spiders. Spiders don't bother me. They should, but I just, you know, uh, I can squash them. And they just don't bother me. My youngest daughter is scared to death of storms. I love storms. If a storm comes up, I love to sit on the back porch and watch it. I've caught my toupee many times. That thing's flying across the yard. Somebody said, yeah, it's gone. <laughs> but uh, I, I love storms. But uh, um, my wife's scared of spiders. My, my third daughter is very claustrophobic. I mean, just... We go on the airplane, and when the lady comes by with the Coca-Cola cart, and just right up against her, she's sweating bullets. She can't hardly stand it. She can put a necklace on, and it, it just it literally just freaks her out trying to get the necklace off because she's just so claustrophobic. My son-in-law is scared of his wife. <laughs> I'm not afraid of spiders. I'm not afraid of storms. It's not that I'm some big bad person, but I'm going to tell you what. You take three steps somewhere, it can scare me to death. Because of my lack of balance and, and because of the multiple sclerosis, I, you know, I, when I go to preach somewhere, the first thing I do, well, I do two things. Number one, I look at the steps and see what am I gonna, how am I gonna navigate that? What am I gonna do? And I, I just, just cause it's something I have to worry about. Second thing is I wanna know where the bathrooms are. I'm 60 years old almost right at it and I, you know, my age, you might have to go to the bathroom. You may not. You don't know. You might find it. You might not. My wife is the bed makingest thing in the world. I'm telling you what. I can get up in the night and go to the bathroom and come back and the bed's made. <laughs> I'll say, sweetheart, can I get in the bed? No, lay right there. The bed's already made. So I'd sleep the rest of the night on the floor. <laughs> I like seeing some people, I'm saying something funny to the people out there saying, he ain't funny. Yes, I am. <laughs> Tell your face to enjoy yourself. I'm telling you what, it's rough looking at some of you. Now, they tell me you've had a long week, so they said you need to laugh a little bit. So they, they flew me in for Brother Chapel's birthday. They were going to put me in a cake and let me jump out of the cake, but they got me in there and I ate my way out. Brother Starn said this morning he's going to get him some skinny jeans. I did get me some skinny jeans. At J.C. Penney, I got some skinny jeans. They say on the back of it, husky, but they're still skinny jeans. <laughs> when you're buying skinny jeans in the big and tall shop, you, something's wrong. <laughs> and your skinny jeans shouldn't have elastic in them. I was in a barbecue restaurant the other day, and there was a young lady waiting on our tables, and she had on blue jeans, and had gaping holes across the thighs and across the knees. And I said, young lady, could I ask you something? My wife said, Dave. I said, leave me alone, somebody ask me. <laughs> I said, did you buy those britches with those holes already in them? She said, well, well, yes. I said, how much did you pay for them? She said, $80. I said, you paid $80 for britches with holes already in them. I said, that's what's wrong with our country right now. <laughs> no wonder we're deplorables, I'm telling you what. We use those bitches to wash the car with after a while, you know, good night. I'm not gonna buy britches with holes in them. I'm just gonna get my own, make my own holes. I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Now, 
the miracles. Here in Acts chapter two, it's unbelievable. There are four great miracles. The first one I wanna show you is the miracle of the mood. The miracle of the mood. Look what the Bible says, if you would, uh, in verse number 46. In verse, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with the pe- all the people. The Lord added the church such a day, such a day we should be saved. The miracle of the mood. This is unbelievable. This is every pastor's dream. To come to church and nobody's, nobody's fussing, nobody's fighting, nobody's looking for this. Looking for this. Here, the miracle of the mood. Here is the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem and they're all on the same page, happy and just, man, do we get to sing? Do we get to lead somebody to Christ? Do we get to work? We, it's unbelievable, the miracle of the mood. They're all on the same page. That is a miracle in a church, I'm telling you, because people are fussing and carrying on. And I had one time when I first became pastor, Now I'll never do this again, but I did it once. I first became pastor, I heard that there was a couple in the church that were not acting right, that were slipping around seeing each other, that were not married. So I got up and for three weeks I preached and I mean I preached hell hot and I just let it have it. Finally after three weeks them not moving and hurting the spirit of the church I said all right folks, there's sin in the church. I didn't say what it was but there's sin in the church and I'm gonna deal with it. Next Sunday night I'm gonna stand in this pulpit and I'm gonna call your name out. We're not gonna let you hurt the church. If, if you don't come to me and confess it and get it right I'm gonna tell the church next Sunday night we're gonna get it straight. You're not gonna hurt our church. And I was young, 34 years old and Thought I had everything, I, I had it all, yeah, I knew what I was doing. And I said, all right, and so I made that announcement. I will never do that again. 632 people came to me and confessed things that week. I mean, of all kind of stuff. My pastor wanted to take me out to lunch, knocked on my door, and the door opened up, and he stood there, and I said, oh, dear God, help us, not him too. I mean, it's unbelievable. But you know what, the spirit of the church, people, and, and I hate to hear people say, well, I'm not getting fed. You know what the problem with that is? It's not the preacher, it's you. Right. Truth of the matter is, when you come to church, you, it ought to be just icing on the cake. You, already, you should have already eaten before you got here. Yeah. You should have already spent time with God and spending time in prayer for the man of God. But the miracle of the mood, the Bible said singleness of heart. They're all together, man. Wouldn't that be great every day you came to church and Nobody's needing anything, just, just, I mean, it's just absolutely, just they came here to worship God. What an unbelievable, unbelievable thing, the miracle of the church. Now, let me tell you what, if each member had a problem, I mean, if you just, if we just had, now this is way past that, but if you had a 75 member church and everybody had a, had a problem, you know, and by the way, the problem, it's never about the, the, the word of God or the blood of Christ. It's usually about the color of the carpet or, or the way the piano was facing or, or who did this or who did that. It's usually about trivial things. But if a pastor of a church of 75 had, they just had people complaining, he'd have to get some type of a, a fire suit to wear just to put out all the fires. It's unbelievable. But the miracle of the mood is phenomenal and you're right here in the book of Acts. And God can still do a miracle. So when you come to church, come to church to lift up the Lord and then already been in prayer for the pastor, excited about the day, excited about what God's gonna do. Come to church with something to, that you, you say, hey Lord, I came to receive a blessing. I wanna do all I can, Lord, show me. And just come like a sponge and soak it up. Amen. We get so full of ourselves. Here's the great miracle, the miracle of the mood. What God is doing in this place is unbelievable. The miracle of the, I mean, the, the Bible says in verse 43 that, uh, that they, they, they all feared God. They had gladness of a heart in verse 46. 40, uh, verse 47, they're praising God with all the people. They're just absolutely just having a thrill time. My pastor brother Wright and I were standing on the platform one time and after church we looked down, there was a pack of cigarettes on the altar. My pastor said, praise God, somebody got the victory. About that time, an old man walked up and said, y'all seen my cigarettes? They fell out of my pocket while I was praying. <laughs> he said, well, Brother McCoy, I believe he needs to be washed again. <laughs> you know, what a great thing to go to church and nobody's worrying about who said what. Who, they didn't call on me to pray. They didn't ask me to sing. They didn't ask me to do this. Just, I mean, if you just came to church and said, hey, I'm here for a blessing. It doesn't matter if it's a 75 member church or 7,500 member church, we're all the same. We all have problems, we all have difficulties, but there ought to be some things you can leave at the door. 
Now you can bring your burdens to the Lord and leave them at the altar and pray, but you ought to come to church with the right spirit, the right attitude, and with the right motivation. The miracle of the mood. What an unbelievable thing that, that you find here. That uh, we, we had a woman came to our church one time and told our pastor, he said, Brother Wright, I've been upset with you for 10 years. He said, oh really? She said, yes, do you remember 10 years ago when my son was bitten in the nursery? He said, yes, ma'am, and I remember getting on those people. She said, right, but I don't think you got on to them bad enough. So for 10 years, she missed out on all kinds of things. She had the wrong attitude. I thought about when I was in the nursery, I bit everything and walked by. I looked like a chicken leg. <laughs> I robbed baby diapers, all kinds of stuff. The miracle of the mood, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable what happens right here in this place. The miracle of the mood and what God does. Now, I'm telling you, folks, God would just let, there's a lot of things God could do if we just get ourselves out of the way. We'd come just looking for the same thing. Instead of, well, I hope he does this. Or, why don't we come to church and say, man, I'm telling you, looking forward, forward to hearing the pastor. Wonder what he's got for me today. Wonder what he can do. I'm looking forward to seeing so-and-so. I'm looking forward to my Sunday school teacher. I'm looking forward to hearing the choir. Man, if you didn't enjoy that choir tonight, something's wrong with you anyway. you got other issues. That was a blessing, man. I'm telling you what, that was something good. Just, you know, just the miracle of the mood is just wonderful. But secondly, there's a second miracle here that's unbelievable. The miracle of the money. The Bible says here, now look if you would, the miracle of the money. Look at verse number 44 if you would. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men to every man had need. Huh. You think, well, that's a socialist just Christianity. Oh, no. You know what the difference is? They weren't forced. They did it on their own. They sold their stuff. They brought the money to the church and said, Preacher, here you go. Whoever needs it, well, just here it is. What an unbelievable miracle. Our church is 117 acres on, uh, on Mill Road in McDonough, Georgia. We first moved there, it was on a dirt road. Did you ever come there when it was on the dirt road? I mean, a potted dirt road, terrible. Just unbelievable. And uh, we were at that on the church road and the county came up to us and said, we're gonna, and the reason we bought the property because a secretary had told me that they were fixing the paved mill road and that property would go sky high, so we bought it at a good price for acreage and we got the property. And since we bought it, it has more than 10 times gone up in price since we bought the property. But well, the county came to us and said, well, we're going to pave Mill Road, but you're going to have to pay from your church to the main highway. I said, I've never heard that before, of a church paying for the paving of, the, of a public road. So we had big meetings and all that. We talked to the commission. had six commissioners of Henry County. We got together, and finally they all working together, and we had this big meeting, and we met that night. They had the, aud the, the auditorium where they had the, uh, uh, the, the, there for the commissioners. It was packed. Standing room only, people standing around the edges. Finally, the commissioners went through several things. They said, all right, we're going to ask Pastor McCoy to stand up here. And I stood up there. and They said, Pastor McCoy, we're asking you to pay the, for the paving of Mill Road from your church about an eighth of a mile up the road. It's going to cost $240,000. They said, Pastor McCoy, what will you do if we vote that you've got to pay for it? I said, well, I'm going to get me a couple of Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets and a shotgun. It's going to be a toll road, and you're going to pay for it. <laughs> and they just looked at each other. One man put his hand on the microphone and said, I don't think he's kidding. The other guy said, he's not. I said, I'm not. I said, it's my road. And they voted six to nothing for the county to pay for the pay for the mill road. God still does miracles. I was a little disappointed. I was looking for getting the Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets myself. But <laughs> Not only did, hey, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask for thing, according to the power of the work within us, not only did he give us the, did he pay for the pavement mill road, but they paid $60,000 of county money to tie into our driveways. God did that for us. The miracle of the mood. If I be a man of God, then why is all this befallen us? Where are the miracles that our fathers spoke of that crossed the Red Sea? Gideon asked. The miracle of the mood. The miracle of the money. See, when God gets your heart, he'll get your pocketbook. 
They're not that far apart. God gets your heart. See, no matter what kind of businessman or businesswoman you think you are, if you're not a tither, you're not as good as you think you, you, you are. Because you're backed up on God. You have to do things God's way. The Bible said, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For we walk by faith and not by sight. God has to do it. I'm telling you right now for that lost loved one, that lost relative, whatever you have, whatever's going on in your life, the financial problems, the situation at work, God's still the miracle worker in business. He can still do a miracle. Don't think, well, we had a great day on Easter. It was wonderful. It's not over. Every day's a new beginning. You keep reaching new heights. You keep going. The miracle of the money. Number three is what I call the miracle of the memberships. The Bible says, if you would look in chapter two and look at verse number 41. Now, I don't wish this on anybody. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Could you imagine that this church, as good, as organized as it is, if 3,000 brand new Christians showed up and said, okay, we're here, ready to get baptized. I'm telling you what, Brother Furso, the, the tadpoles would know his social security number before he got through baptizing. It'd be unbelievable. And can you imagine if every family, in that th- what they all had a two-year-old, and they need to go to the nursery. The Bible says, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. I remember the first person I ever baptized. I didn't know anything about it. I watched Brother First so closely this morning, and it happens all the time. When you baptize somebody, you put your hand on the back of their neck, and the water is very buoyant, and, and you know, it doesn't matter if it's the biggest one. You can baptize them pretty easily most of the time if they don't fight you. But if you put your hand on the back of their neck, and you control the top of them, you put them down, put them right back up, it's pretty easy. My brother and I got saved at the same time. I was seven, he was five. My daddy motioned for us. He was in the Baptist. My daddy was a pastor. And he motioned for us. My brother did a cannonball in the baptistry. <laughs> Went out in the choir and everything. My daddy held him under. He said, first time my daddy's ever stuttered. I baptized you in the name of the <laughs> and just kept him under there for a while. <laughs> He's still not right today, my, my brother. <laughs> He said, the Father, the Son, what's that other one? <laughs> First time I baptized somebody, I didn't know that. Never baptized anybody. Except for in the swimming pool when you're just playing around with your kids when they're little. So uh, I got ready and I, brother, first of all, I took my hand and put it in the middle of their back. I didn't know. And when I went to lay down, I baptized you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When I went down like that, all of a sudden, then it's all the weights in your arm. When I went, I took them down too low or something. I went down like that and their feet came up that way. (laughs) So I let go here and pushed them down there. Then that went down. We wrestled for 30 seconds in that water. The guy came up and said, you like to kill me. I said, hey, you're saved. You're going to heaven. What's a big worry? (laughs) Good night. Baptism's not essential for salvation. Just be glad you got it, son. Good night. We had a guy in our church that was six foot five that he got, back, he got saved every other week. And somebody that gets for multiple professions of faith consistently, it's a lack of spiritual growth in their life. They're probably saved the first time, but they're just, you've got to grow, you've got to read, you've got to study, you've got to walk with God. So every time he'd do something wrong, he'd get saved again. That was usually about every week. It's the honest truth. He came to our church and he came down the aisle. I think it's his 15th time being saved of that year. And so he came down and Brother Wright told me, I'd never done this before and I, you know, now this is my second or third time to baptize. And he said, would you baptize this guy? And I said, yes, sir. So I took him back there and reached out my hand way up there and I said, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I'm whispering to him, bend your knees. And I laid him down. When I laid him down, I didn't allow enough room for how long he was. So I laid his head on the steps so his body's underwater, but his face is just like this, water's right here. <laughs> So I didn't know what to do. So I held him there and I just took water and splashed for the rest of him. <laughs> Trying to get him under, you know. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. 
And I brought him up and then I told my pastor this honest truth. I said, Brother Wright, I said, I baptized him, but I don't think I got him totally wet. His head's laid on the steps. He said, I'll get him next week. <laughs> and he did. Every pastor's got a baptismal store somewhere. You know, you've had baptized huge men and you did fine, then you have a eight-year-old soak you wet, you know, just trying to fight or whatever. But the miracle of the membership, can you imagine? And they're not fussing. Nobody's fussing about the camel parking places. I'm not coming back to this church. That camel bit my camel. Oh, it happens. Things that are just pure t- don't matter to anything. I wonder if they had handicapped parking places for camels back then. I don't know. With the two humpers here, the one humpers here. Or I don't know. Maybe you got an extra parking place if you had three humps. I don't know what. And they say that a camel, all that is, is a horse that was designed by a Baptist committee. The miracle of the membership. 3,000 souls one day. You study the word of God, it goes on in the book of Acts. You find them with 5,000. You find them with 8,000. Then the Bible says multitudes. They couldn't count them. Revival's going on in, in, in Israel. What a wonderful thing. And folks, I want to tell you what you're facing. God can give you a miracle. Whatever you're, whatever you're going. And hey, what you need might be nothing to me. But what I need might be nothing to you. But it's a great need in my life. And I'm telling you that God still can. And I want to see the miracles. I want to see God do something. I want to see God do something beyond my capability. That I can't say one word, look what I did. I want to say, look what God did. So you have the miracle of the mood, the miracle of the money, the miracle of the membership that brings you down to the last one. I think it's the whole thing, the whole key is the miracle of the message. The Bible says when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. What did they hear? They heard in verse 36, they heard the the preaching of the apostle Peter. And it's such a miracle that God let them understand it in their own language. I have no problem with this. That God let them understand the word of God in their own language. Peter couldn't speak a foreign language. He couldn't cover all the bases. People got saved. I'm going to tell you the, the life's blood of Lancaster Baptist Church is what you do with the message. Get the message of Jesus Christ out. That'll take care of the mood and the money and the membership. That'll all fall in place. You take care of that. I was on the plane the other day, come back from Michigan, and I was talking to a fellow and witnessing to him, and I'm going through the plan of salvation. I reached in my pocket, got out of track, and I began to show him verses in the Bible and talk to him, you know, and he's so intently listening, and I'm praying, thinking, man, I'm going to win this guy to Christ, and I'm excited about it. We're going through it. The stewardess comes by. She said, sir, can we get you anything to drink? He said, I'll take a Bud Light. I said, good night. What's the use? Bring me one, too. I'm just a... <laughs> no, I didn't say that, really. I didn't. My wife did, I didn't. (laughs) The miracle of the message. God can save and do things you never dreamed of. If you get busy about doing what God wants, and listen, the Bible said he came to this earth. The whole reason he came was to seek and to save. That was lost. That's strange to me. A God that knows everything and is everything became human flesh, and he came on a mission to find lost people to tell them about himself. They change lives. I give this illustration through. My wife's greatest love of her life when she was six years old was her papa, her grandfather. She lived in Alabama and grew up there in Tuscaloosa. And um, her papa used to save pennies and on the weekend would take her, they said, we're making the loop. They would go to all kinds of stores with those pennies where you could buy penny candy. She loved her papa with all of her heart. She worried about him because he smoked and 
she's six years old and just, uh, said, just so concerned me. He didn't go to church. Good man. He loved my wife, Trish. He loved her and, he, he, and she loved him. Finally, one day, so burdened, she wrote out the plan of salvation in her six-year-old handwriting and put it on a, a paper and her mother helped her with it and folded it up and sealed it up. She signed it, told him she loved him, gave him the plan of salvation in a six-year-old handwriting and sent it to her grandfather. She never heard anything. Didn't know if he ever received it. Didn't know anything. Prayed for him for years. Fifteen years go past. Now her father is pastoring in Lake City, Georgia, Lake City Baptist Tabernacle. On a Sunday morning, I think, was it Easter Sunday morning, sweetheart? It was Easter Sunday morning. Fifteen years later, her granddaddy walked into church. She was so happy to see him, ran, hugged him. During the invitation, he let go of the back of the pew and walked down and got saved. He got saved and they were rejoicing. And standing there, hugging one another in the tears and all that, he reached in his wallet, pulled out a letter from a six-year-old girl, and he said, I can't tell you how many times I've read this letter. He said, I've kept it all these years. And he was gloriously saved. Fifteen years passed. God's still in the miracle worker business. What do you need? You need money? It's just a zero to God. You need help. You need healing. Whatever it is, God still can because there's a verse in Hebrews that tells me so. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same God that walked into the wilderness, oh, wait a minute, Jesus wasn't there then. Whoa, wait a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says, and that rock that followed them was Christ. In Genesis chapter 1, God the Father said, let us make man in our own image. Who was he talking to? He wasn't talking to me. I believe when they walked in the garden in the cool of the day, I believe there was five of them. I believe it was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Adam and Eve. Same God, same Lord, same book. And the same God that opened up the Red Sea can open it up for you. Can it open up for me? I was telling Brother Howe Sunday school class this morning, <laughs> I've got three grandchildren that are the love of my life. I apologized to our church the other day because I said, I don't know what happened, but we just don't like our daughters anymore, but we love our grandkids. <laughs> I have a rule at my house, I don't give my grandkids anything unless they want it. <laughs> my three-year-old granddaughter, my wife, they call her Sasha, she went in and she bought some, uh, she bought some uh, orange juice with extra pulp. She took a big squig of that. She said, hey, Sasha, who put the coleslaw in the orange juice? the love of my life. I don't know how I could function to know that one of them was lost. Now, two of them have to reach the age of accountability. That's coming. One of them's already been saved. I don't normally baptize at my church anymore because my staff members do it for me. And, but when that, uh, those other two get saved, I'll, I'll baptize for her. There's no way I wouldn't not do it. I don't know how I could even live. The Lord be with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Oh yeah? Then where are the miracles? Where's the miracle in your life? What can you point back to and say, hey, it was God. It was God. God wants you to do something for him. A miracle. And the same God, the same Lord, the same one, still alive today, can help you with anything you could ever dream of. What do you need? If you could write a blank check from God to take care of whatever needs you have, whatever it is, it might have nothing to do with money. 
There's a lot of nursing homes filled up with people that are wealthy. They'd give every dime to have their health. What miracle do you need? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God still can.